apologize that the presentation will have one slide added because I added one more method to my looping <laughs> and did not send it um, in advance to uh, Ed. Uh, but basically, yes, uh, these are going to be two completely different things. One is speed in the loops uh, tested, and the other one is just a thing I found how to get the results from Elmer models straight away to Word without uh, typing it. I think this is a nice thing because everybody should uh, avoid retyping results as much as possible. OK, I'll try to share my uh, screen now and show you the presentation. Mm -hmm. Good. So, okay. Okay, can you see it fine now? Full screen? Yes, it looks perfect. Okay, fantastic. So, fast loops and exporting my models to Word. Uh, first, the several hints on performance. Basically, the, the first part of the presentation will be about performance, uh, but let's not worry about performance before we have a reason. Usually, uh, processing time is cheaper than thinking time. We've got more important things to do than perfectioning our code. Uh, if it works, it works, and this is fine. Uh, and also uh, another reason is that time consuming processing is always within ready products, within ready code, which we will not have access to. Uh, so either we can we have to buy a stronger machine or uh, reduce our data if we cannot make it uh, within sen sensible time. But otherwise, there's no way to uh, to intervene. Um, also, we can use uh, in terms of looping, uh, we can use uh, ready tools that are there in um, R. In base R, it's the apply family of functions and also the function match, which will uh, play some role today. And I would also advise to look at map functions from per package. Um, personally, I haven't got uh, experience with them, but I have seen the uh, seen the uh, description in the book, uh, which is mentioned here, and they look like a better and consistent, uh, more consistent tool than um, the apply from base R. I don't know Ed, if you if you agree with me. Um, uh, I I think they, they look quite fine. Um, and what said, uh, there is uh, some uh, there are some reasons to uh, simple things to uh, improve performance. First of all, avoid growing objects in a loop. A loop like adding elements to a vector. Pre-allocation of memory is absolutely. Uh, vital and uh, makes for a much cleaner code usually. Um, and graphics, this is something that is really computationally intensive, but usually there are ready, to, ready tools to, uh, to deal with images. And unless somebody has a reason, usually the, the coders do not touch to uh, the R coders do not touch the inside of images. Uh, but I had some reason to do it, and then I uh, got uh, against um, uh, against limitations in performance, and this is why this presentation uh, has uh, has a reason because the differences between several approaches were dramatic. Okay, so what basically what I wanted to do, I needed to display matrix matrices, numeric matrices as a color scale, just as um, it is shown here. Um, th this example comes from uh, Excel, from um, color scales, uh, but I'm just using it to illustrate uh, the greens are low values, uh, reds are high values, yellows are intermediate values. Uh, and just for confusion, I will be using a different color scale here, here in this, this example. Um, how is it achieved, this displaying colors as uh, displaying uh, numeric values as a color scale. This is achieved by, for example, when we decide how many colors are we going to use, for example, 16, we have to scale and round um, our uh, numeric values um, so that every uh, row value is um, assigned the number of the color. And basically that would be it for a grayscale image because we need just one value for grayscale, but to make it into colorful image, we need three values to describe every of these original uh, values. For example, red, green, blue, like here. 
uh, or hue saturation brightness or whatever it is, but basically we need three dimensions, so it, it will be split into three dimensions. So here we've got the, the X is the original vector, um, vector of pixels. I'm, um, I'm neglecting the physical dimension of the of the image. I'm only interested in the values now, so the, the image can be um, can be represented by uh, by a vector here for simplicity. X call is uh, the numbers of colors colors from the palette. Uh, this is a table of colors where every index, every color number is assigned three values of red, green, and blue, and we want to get uh, a matrix consisting of three columns for red, for green, for uh, blue. This operation is very fast because it's scaling and rounding and we are not using any loops. And if we want to do it in loop, this we have to make it uh, think about it twice because um, this can be really slow. Uh, method one, we can loop along the original image vector, so as many pixels as we have, there will be as many iterations of the loop. For example, the loop starts from the number nine, looks for number nine in the index value, okay, it's here, and uses these values to build that, um, to build that matrix of colors. Um, and in the other method, the, the second method, I will go forward, we will be looping along the rows of the call space table. This is the color space or call space table. So basically there will be as many loop iterations as there are rows in this table. So already it looks a little better. Um, every of these methods will be tested in two versions and surprisingly enough uh, they um, this distinction between method 1A and method 1B uh, makes quite a lot of difference in the operation speed. Um, in the first, uh, in, the, in the A version of each method, a dummy matrix will be created in advance. Let's go back again. This is one object. This is a matrix and we will find three values and just stick them as a row of the matrix, okay? And in method 1b or 2b as well, there will be three separate dummy vectors for RGB values, and it, it, only the vectors will be indexed. They will not be um, joined in advance into a uh, value. This will be three different objects, vector of reds, vector of greens, vectors of, of blue. OK, method again, method 1A, looping along the vector, uh, the original vector, with options of uh, putting the value into a matrix, looping along the image vector with the option of putting the values into three separate vectors. Method 2, looping uh, over the uh, rows of the color space table. And again, in those two subvariants as 2A and 2B. And finally, method number three is much simpler. We are using function match, which is looking for um, for um, the occurrences of these values, of values of the second vector in the first one. So, for example, function match, what, what does it do? Look, it operates on vector x call and on this colored vector here, the column of the call space matrix. It When it has a, a nine, it is looking for nine in this value, uh, in this uh, place, and is replacing it with the index, that is the, uh, the uh, which row it is in this table. So, Finally, we'll get uh, index one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. It will be replaced with the index seven from this table and so on and so on. But it is all going behind the scenes. We are not looking under the bonnet here. It is just simply done with one single one line of code by our function match. 
OK, um, let's um, let's uh, switch to the code now. Uh, one moment. OK, can you see the R studio now? Yep, I see it's fine. And this is the script that's uh, available on the Herrick website called loops.r, right? Herrick yes. loops.r. Yes, I will update it with the with the version three because I have that uh, the third uh, option three of my mm, function. Uh, what is uh, in the script? Uh, if I press Control Plus, will it make it slightly larger? Ed? Yeah, no, not working like that. Uh, control okay. Shift Plus. Yes, Control Shift. Yeah, good. So what is in the script? Uh, we are using library micro benchmark and library TikTok to assess time and library imager to to output the images finally, because we have to know what happened, what 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 our output is. Uh, users functions, the, the function that does the first step scale. Uh, and the other one is the call space function. This is the one which uh, outputs the uh, colors tables, the, the, um, the uh, table which contains the RGB values for every color. This is basically a wrapper um, around uh, base R function HCL colors. HCL colors um, outputs a palette in the form of uh, hex strings but we need to split it into three separate vectors of reds, greens, and blues, and this is what the call space does as a wrapper around HCL. Uh, so let's let's read in those functions, and we will also see. Okay, we'll see what the call space is. Just as it was in the presentation, we've got a column of reds, greens, and blues, and the indices from 0 to 15. Uh, this is for a 16 color space. And we will be looking for a match between the original vector, the original image, and the all those uh, and, and this index. And to test the speed, um, the function remap will be in five in five versions, as I described in the presentation. Remap 1a, uh, which is using, look, this is creating dummy vectors of the same length as the original image and putting them together into a data frame, or it could be a matrix as well, and then it will be uh, is, uh, substituting every um, uh, substituting a whole line in the MVA data frame with the values found in the table call space. It's just one line. We are using substitution of the whole line in the MVA data frame. In one B version, look. We first we find the uh, index. Uh, in the uh, call space table, and we are doing three separate substitutions. Well, and only then it is all put together into a data frame named MVA. Now we are looping in version 2a. Now we are looping along the call space. So for 16 colors, there will be only 16 iterations of this loop. And here in version A, we are using substitution of the whole line as before, while in version 2B, there will be three vectors, each will be substituted separately. And then the MVA will be put together. And finally, We've got remap version three. 
which is not using any looping, but it finds the indices, um, the J indices, the indices of the mm, call space table using function match, and then does the separate substitution in every vector using this J index and putting together MVA again. So in the, the, we've got five versions of the function to test. The output is exactly the same in each case. It is returning the MVA table uh, of the same length as the original image, but, con uh, but uh, containing three um, uh, three columns, three or three separate vectors, uh, three columns for each uh, color. OK. Um, let's then uh, find out, first of all, if the images are exactly the same, if the uh, the functions are really doing the same thing. We've got at here. Here is the, this code is testing, uh, outputting images made by every function separately. Okay, so let's go, and we will already have some timing. One A is doing the job. Function one A is working now. You can get your drink for a moment. If I remember well, it's around one minute. How big is your fake uh, data set again? Uh, 100,000 uh, 100, pixels is the 100, origin, thousand. is the image because I'm using, uh, I will show you the, the image when it's done. Uh, this is the image that comes together with the imager, uh, uh, with the imager package. It's named Boats. We'll have a look at the images in a moment. Gotcha. 256 by 384. This is like the strong arm method of uh, <clears throat> looping across rows and columns. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, well, well, the image, the image is uh, straight and probably first or, or maybe not in because this is a slightly simplified version of the functions I had before. And it, it was my first idea to do this graphic directly in uh, graphics directly in R and I was very disappointed with her performance. <laughs> so I started <laughs> digging. <laughs> It's not a big, big image. I think one of the things that while we wait for your function to run, one of the things that um, when you move up from very tiny data sets <clears throat> um, are is criticized as a programming language against other pure programming languages because it's not very fast. And it, it's why I assume you'll move on here to the uh, matrix, um, much, much more efficient app, um, functions that uh, that sidestep this problem. <clears throat> yeah, I think the processor is busy with some other stuff now. You're going to just blame it on your poor son's computer now, aren't you? Yeah. That's the, the best machine in the in the house. OK, look, 163 seconds. And I think it's because the computer was also busy with teams and everything because earlier in my tests it was much, uh, much. It was shorter. But look, we have tested all five approaches. Using a TikTok package to show us the time. Two minutes. In, for the first function, five seconds, zero, zero, eight, zero, zero, six, zero, zero, four. That's a tremendous difference. Okay, um, so now I'm planning to show you the images so that you know what it is. Um, Uh, 
Mm, I don't know if you if we will be able to see the image directly from here. No, uh, it's not shared. No, OK. Mm -hmm. OK, here we are. So this is the original image, the grayscale image. Image output by function version 1a, 1b, 2a, 2b, 3. As we see, they are identical. All functions did the same job. OK. So let's uh, continue testing. Um, OK, uh, and it was for 16 colors. We could do the same test again for 256 colors too. But I've got a separate section in this uh, code uh, in the script to do the test uh, using micro benchmark. OK, so um, what it is doing, it is using five pseudo images, uh, four pseudo images uh, which are generated uh, on the go uh, using uh, RU NIF. Uh, and they've got a number of pixel, pixels which is stated here 1000, 10,000, 100,000, and uh, a million pixels. First, let's do the test. Uh, the tests now in the um, opposite uh, sequence. Uh, that is, uh, we'll be doing the test on Remap 3 first. Okay. And we'll get uh, our uh, we'll get the results in uh, just a moment. We'll get the results uh, in the form of a uh, CSV file. Okay, eight options using that is six for sixteen and for two hundred and fifty six colors for four images. So there will be there were eight. They were all uh, processed very quickly. Now let's uh, we'll see the results in a moment. Two uh, A, and let's change this to two A so that we will get uh, the results in the proper file. Um, good. We can see that it's thinking a little longer on the image number four and eight. These are the largest ones. OK. To be. To be is faster. OK, let's risk one. B. Sixteen colors. No, two hundred and fifty-six colors is being tested. Mm -hmm. We're really feeling it now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe uh, you could say something about a practical case where you'd be aware of the time and the efficiency. Uh, did you come across this in some of your analyses for your research? Um, what I needed this thing to, uh, I needed to replace a functionality from a, uh, from a GPR processing um, software, uh, which was a paid version and cost quite a lot on the project. So, well, it was considered to buy the full version of the program, but finally I thought, 
OK, I'm doing the processing in a different way anyway to, to what was offered in within the framework of the software. Um, of the professional software, I, I was doing completely different analysis and basically what I needed that um, uh, software was to look at the profiles, to uh, look at graphically at the contents uh, of, of the profiles. So I thought that perhaps it's best to uh, write my own script to uh, replace that functionality. Uh, I was I came across uh, the imager um, or image R, whatever, whatever to call it, um, uh, package, and uh, I built the functionalities around it. Uh, just built several functions that take a matrix and make it into a, make it into a PNG image. This is this was the reason I was using it, and of course I needed something that works in seconds, not in minutes. Okay. And now to test uh, to test the one A, this will be the last one. We will use a slightly shorter. Um, we, we will not be um, uh, processing the image which has one million pixels because it takes too long. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. So, um, okay, uh, this is a graph showing uh, uh, showing the processing time. From micro benchmark for the image of the size 1000, 10,000 pixels, and um, 100,000 pixels. Uh, we can see that the processing time is uh, uh, all around 60 seconds for uh, for the function in its first original version. This is the improved one. Four and a half second for uh, for the uh, one hundred thousand pixels, and we could make sort of a curve showing that for in for this version of of the function, it is also dependent very much on uh, how many colors we had because this is sixteen colors. This is two hundred fifty six colors takes eight seconds to process to be two and a half seconds for the for the image, which is one million pixels. Look, the previous uh, the previous graphs ended here and we had 60 seconds for this one. So what would be for the one one million pixels and one million pixels is not a large image nowadays. And finally, remap three. The times are in one hundredths of seconds, expressing one hundredths of seconds. And there is no large gap between the 16 color and 256 color version. So basically, this is the fastest option to use the function remap. Uh, let's go back to the presentation for a moment. Okay. Got the times here. Uh, this is for 16 colors. Look, the image size 1,000 uh, pixels. It's image that is basically non-existent nowadays. We are counting in megapixels, but I did not do the test because already 100,000 pixels was was taking two minutes to go in my earlier tests. On the one megapixel level, 34 seconds is still too long. The reasonable times are uh, obtained only with uh, with the second version, with the version two, of which 2B is faster. And finally, 
version three using function match, which works somewhere using lower level languages, uh, takes just a little time to go. And for 256 colors, also times are nearly one, uh, one minute for uh, the first version of the function, much better for the second version and still the best times are used with the function notch. Uh, and please notice that uh, um, that uh, the difference between 16 colors and 256 colors it is non-existent for uh, for the match uh, function, while there is uh, quite a large difference here. Version 2B working on 16 colors on one megapixel image had a time of one quarter of a second, while working on 256 colors was two and a half seconds. And this difference isn't so between uh, when, when we are using the match function, so it's the best option for us. OK, the conclusions, the fastest approach was to avoid looping, explicit looping completely, and if possible to use function match, of course, for this task where we wanted to match two vectors, because we may need some loops that do something else. Substitution in vectors was found to be much faster than in matrices. So it was my first, my initial mistake when I wrote the function for the first time, my initial mistake was to join the three, um, the three vectors, red, green and blue into one matrix and using quite superficially, quite elegant substitution row by row. Uh, I think that R is using a lot of processing power just to deal with, with such an arrangement, and it's much faster to operate on single vectors and join the vectors into one matrix or data frame uh, later. Uh, and it's also better to loop, uh, to loop through the lookup table than through uh, the object of interest. Uh, I think that every iteration of um, of the loop uh, gets some overhead, some housekeeping behind it, which is using time. So it's best to reduce the number of iterations. Uh, well, in this case, we also have to think about missing values and so on, but it's when you're using function much, just read the manual and just general um, general good advice is uh, to Google for everything and scavenge as much as possible for code because the problems we have were already solved by someone else. Okay, so that to be it about the um, about the mm, uh, speed in loops. Okay, would you like me to go on now or? To, to the Elmer models, which will be much shorter, hopefully, or are there any questions? Any comments or questions? I think a thing that I, when I think about speed in R, um, you've gone through some examples at a, at a fairly low level, talking about um, just how fast operations are and mm -hmm. You know, the old fashioned way, the slow way is to do uh, one operation, you know, per cycle or every few cycles for your central processing unit. And then each of those alternative methods exploit in, in some way, either um, making making that work faster within the number of cycles it takes or doing more work per cycle mm -hmm. <laughs> parallelization. Yes, um, multiple indices. Yes. Yeah. And it's kind of like a technical thing and we only come across it, but even even today, the time that I come across this kind of thing often in my own work is um, if I'm trying to open big data files, that's one time I come across it. Uh, another time is if I'm transforming data and rarer is it that I write my own 
program to manually go through something. I don't do that very often <laughs> uh, in R, but uh, sometimes sometimes I do. And when you do, you'd have to look for uh, if you have more than you know a few megabytes of data, you have to be aware of these efficiencies. Yeah, it's good. Let's go on to LMER unless um, someone has any questions. No. Questions. Carry on. Okay. Okay. So briefly, uh, LMER. Okay. Let's clear the table. Uh, what is this script doing? Basically, the first part of it is just a preparation of course libraries uh, and uh, some functions and reading in data uh, the, the script proper starts here with the LMR models LMER models uh, so um, okay, no Dobra. okay um, uh, this is uh, this is just reading in data up to line uh, 35 is reading in data and preparations of the of the data table for the LMER models to work then the creation of the models and what I wanted to show you is basically the export of the models to word and export of the data summary to word if you are not uh, aware of uh, the existence of such uh, tools it's I think worth it okay I will simply hit the source and we'll see what happens uh the libraries no they will they were already already in creation of the models with some warnings we'll see the output mm -hmm. Again, it's slower than I was alone in the in front of the computer. I think it's thinking about the, the whole team's stuff. Uh, good. Uh, we've got um, four LMER models created, MS0, 1, 2 and 3. Um, this is a list of these, the names of the models, which uh, allowed me to loop the export into uh, into loops, but what was used to export the table? Uh, library named GT Summary and another one named Flex Table. From those two, I used functions named Table Regression as Flex Table and Save as DocX. The output looks mm, like that. Was anybody, has anybody happened to use this uh, sort of tool? This is an export of p-values and uh, confidence, confidence interval directly from the model. We have a model that uh, contains tire pressure, tillage depth and layer as factors. Uh, tire pressure was on two um, on two levels as high and low and the model uh, is using high pressure as um, reference value and is showing uh, the coefficient for uh, the low tire pressure as well as the confidence interval and the p-value for the distinction between those two and now beat me or kill me i'm wondering whether this where this confidence interval comes from uh, i think it's some sort of bootstrapping but googled for i googled for it and basically have no no idea 
uh, how it is created. If anybody has any any thoughts, I would he hear it very gladly. What what are you asking about the Prismic? There was a tractor going by my window, and I didn't quite catch. Okay, yes, about the confidence interval, how it can be created. I think it may be some sort of bootstrapping, but I did not find any certain um, any any certain certain information about it. Yeah, it is bootstrapping. It's resampling your data over and over depending on how much data is there. Mm -hmm. So it's it's subsampling your data. It's exactly right. But uh, I think that, uh, well, I'm wondering if uh, this is created by the model and is already in the object output by the by the LMER model, or it is only um, put into in, into this table at the stage of its uh, when this uh, uh, when the flex table is working. This is okay. something I, I don't know. Are you know. using LMER test uh, yes. in your script? Uh, let's go back to the script. Mm. No, I think that the uh, LMR, LMER LME four package, the LMER function, um, implement that bootstrapping and what's happening is. They're they're for each of your um, coefficients that are being estimated. So, the intercept okay. for each of your factor levels, or the in, the um, slope for each continuous variable, it's, uh, it's it's already in the in the model. It's already in the model, I believe. Yeah. 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 I, I was looking through the model objects. They are very complicated lists. Yes. And didn't come to any formal any final conclusion. Yeah, a lot of our literature, I mean, the the reason you have to have those in the model is because um, in regular Gaussian simple ANOVA or simple linear regression, you make an assumption about the distribution of um, residuals in the Z test against mm -hmm. which you test whether your coefficient is different to zero. But in mixed effects models, they they bootstrap it to try to estimate what that distribution is. OK, yeah. Fine. So basically, this is if uh, this is something I think worth knowing because uh, we get the, the um, we use the models and we often end up retyping the uh, results and putting them into tables and the likelihood of making a mistake when you are doing it over and over in many tables over many pages is uh, I would say more than one. So this is a way where you can get um, get um, the uh, p values and coefficients from models directly using just uh, several lines of code. Uh, this is basically this bit of of my code because the, the loop is just um, uh, substituting objects from a list. Um, so this is what is doing the really what is doing the job. Even you can uh, you can use some formatting style value. There, there's some uh, ways to format the tables in a way you would like and you get tables in Word. Uh, which replaces um, it and it also replaces um, the whole uh, later uh, the whole uh, post hoc tests in this case. OK, are there any questions for this part? Yeah, walk, walk us through this little trick you're doing because um, I myself would just do it manually <laughs> also or just um, somehow manipulate the actual model object. So to tell us what you're doing here just one more time. OK, you say about this loop and uh, that objects. Uh, good. Uh, it is um, from the from the uh, object space. There, I'm using the function filter. I, I googled it out. It's I'm, I'm a scavenger. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm using a function named class filter, which is defined uh, defined briefly here <clears throat> to filter out the models that belong to the class Elmier model Elmier test. Uh, 
this yeah. is the, the, the class de de delivered by Delmir models. Uh, of course, I th this is a, a little bit of a primitive function because uh, it, it, this class is uh, defined directly, but uh, I only need this class here. It could be um, a separate uh, parameter for for the uh, for the function. So this function is defined here, and it is used to make a list of names um, of the objects of the set of this class. It contains four. Uh, four names ms 0 1 2 and 3 and this loop here uh, sequence along uh, the objects uh, the, the, that is objs uh, um, vector and is getting the object uh, f based on the name OBJS OI, it will be, for example, the first name MS0, and get uh, is a function, uh, is a base uh, R function that replaces the name with the objects taken from uh, a given environment. So, uh, function get is given a string of value MS0, and it looks for the object uh, in the environment. It's finding object MS0, and uh, substitute it, substitutes it um, uh, the found object to uh, the mm, uh, to the next function, which is making an operation on it. So this is how it this loop looks. Okay, so it somehow reaches into the model object and just pulls out the coefficients, yes. the parts yes. are interested yeah. in. Yeah. OK, yeah. an interesting trick. How did, how did you find this? A lot of Googling or did you get a tip from uh, the R for Data Science book or some other? Mm, I think it, it was Googling and mostly I end up on Stack Overflow, so it must have been from there. Yeah, I was just trying to uh, conjure up a simpler example, but uh, you get the standard errors of your estimate of your means just from the normal output from a from a um, <clears throat> from a linear model from the summary function, you get a table for every coefficient. Uh, yes, and then from that you can derive the confidence interval. Okay, uh, if you look at this block of code where there is the export to Excel, which we, we may look into it, but not necessarily. I'm um, getting the uh, the content of the model using ANOVA here. I don't know if it's correct, but uh, oh, well. Yeah. Oops. OK. Um, it, it can be made more uh, in a more manual way, in a simpler way too. But uh, this was something I uh, uh, I just want a table in Word, in Word to put into my uh, thesis. So what we are looking at now is the result of that earlier loop. Uh, these are the uh, these are the uh, elements of the model uh, exported to uh, Excel. Yeah, yeah, very interesting. I guess. Um... I guess uh, the way that I would do it is more, um, yeah, crude. <laughs> when I when I do things like that, mm -hmm. I would just share my screen real quick while you were talking. I was okay. trying, to, trying to figure out uh, what I would do. It is I just made up while you were talking the uh, LME4 library. I asked you about LME our test so we can have our p values back. Thank you. <laughs> I just made up a fake data set. So I made a Y and X and I made a factor. So the factor is a repeated measures on, you know, some ID it could be your your mm -hmm. soil sites or a patient or a, an animal or something. Made that into a data frame. And then I did a simple linear model of my fake Y explained by my explanatory variable, my fake X. And I did a random intercept model for my ID variable. 
mixed effects model. We can look at my summary. Um, and we get a random effect with my ID. Uh, of course, nothing significant because I just made the data up. It's all fake and random. But um, the test of X also should be non-random. Thing that I wanted to show is that the way that I would automate pulling out of those things, if if I were going to do this, if it was an elaborate model and it was worth it, <clears throat> is if we look at the structure of this model object, we'll get a, a very ugly set of outputs <laughs> of all sorts of names in here. And uh, we can exploit these names. If I just pull my screen over, we can exploit these names to um, to uh, pull out the stuff we want. Mm -hmm. so, for example, we could we could pull out the um, the beta estimates for the model, and we could pull out the upper and lower bounds for the confidence interval. We could um, you know, dig deeper and find all sorts of stuff in here. And I think that's the way that I have done it mm -hmm. typically when I want to do something crazy like that. If you have a big model, it's worth it because, like you said, it creates the chance for uh, um, human error and uh, all the rest. I'm trying to find a way to unshare my screen now. There we go. Give it back to you. That was very interesting, Prismak. You took us on a long journey and you uh, talked about. Uh, speeding up the code, and you talked about a practical use of exploiting the uh, LME, LME data object. Sometimes we do that. I, I find that people ignore almost all the contents of the linear model objects. <laughs> Sometimes yeah, well, I, I was trying to look into that manually, but it's it's really the the, the objects, the lists are so huge that I wasn't finally I wasn't sure what is what. So I found out that somebody already made a code that does it automatically. I find these days that there are so many, I haven't checked how many um, packages there are these days, but it's probably close to 20,000 these days. And um, I just can't keep up myself. And usually for solutions like this, there are multiple people who have made it their own solution. And it's just a, a matter of finding which one you, you know, find first. <laughs> So that's cool. Thank you. Any comments or questions from anyone? Um, I see, I saw Herman earlier. You're in the chat. Are you uh, on deck for next week? Are we all ready? You... Uh, hello, yeah. Yes. Or next Wednesday, yeah. Yes, okay. All right. Then thanks, Pershmac. Thank and, you. And uh, we'll look for, uh, we'll look for what's happening next week. And um, we'll take it from there. I'm going to stop the recording here.